Tonight's guest was featured on episode 434, and on that show he told us about a huge dogman that walked up and stood directly underneath his hunting stand. Well, just a few days ago we had another encounter, and that's what he's come back to tell us about. Of course, I'm talking about Mike. Mike, thanks for coming back. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks so much for coming back. I just feel bad that you're back for the reason we're going to talk about here tonight. Mike, for any of the listeners who missed episode 434, please tell them about yourself. I grew up in southern Michigan, lived down here my whole life. Grew up on a farm, been hunting and fishing for most of my life up until the instant in episode 434. I've been very familiar with the woods. I've basically lived my life out in the woods up until that instant. It's always unfortunate when someone has to have a dogman encounter, but when someone like you who spends their whole life almost out there in the woods, it just makes it so much more difficult when you have an encounter with one of these things. Yeah, I can only imagine how difficult this has been for you. Talking about the whole difficulty angle, until you had that encounter a few days ago, how had things been going for you? Uh, They were doing a lot better. I was starting to make more efforts into going back out. And I've been back out to my mom's place where I had this happen. And I've been making more efforts and going back out in the woods and stuff. And the last time I went out there, I didn't feel anywhere near as much fear as I did before. I wasn't shaking. I wasn't hyperventilating. And I even had enough courage, I guess, to take my mom out there and show her where I had to happen. And I told her exactly how it happened and showed her everything. It didn't feel as dark and I didn't feel the dread that I felt before. So I was quite happy about being able to get back out there and start getting back in the progress of getting back out in the woods and start having my life back. Did you get a form of relief from taking her out there and showing her the place where it happened and walking her through all the things and how they played out? I got relief, yes, but uh, it didn't come as like overwhelming as I thought it would be. I thought taking someone out there and showing them, hey, you know, this is what happened. This is why it was terrifying me. I thought it would be a little bit more relieving than what it was, but I still was scared enough to the point where I had to tell both her and my fiance that went out with us that I I can't stick out here for much longer. I got to go back up. How did your mom respond as you were walking her through what happened that day? Her reaction was about what I figured. With her being, you know, she's a believer in all things that are cryptid. She believes in Bigfoot and stuff like that. And like I told you before, she's had her own experiences out there at the farmhouse. But she said that, you know, she's not afraid of it. I'm like, well, I'm glad you are because I still am. And it's been several years since then and she told me she's like well at least you're making the effort of getting back out here because for the longest time I didn't even want to go out to my mom's house because of what had happened every time I went out there I felt that instant dread and I told her that you know the reason why I haven't been coming out all often is because of what happened she's like well I'm at least glad you're trying to make it back out here to get over this. Well, it goes without saying, I'm so glad to hear that you got back on the horse too. That's great. If you'd like to be able to listen to the show without ads and have full access to bonus content, that's an option. To find out how, please go to dogmanencounters.com forward slash podcast. Your most recent encounter happened just a few days ago. From what I understand, you had a pretty rough night last night. Please talk us through that. Yeah. um, I work 
second shift. My shifts run from three to twelve thirty. My buddy that I carpool with home doesn't get out till one o'clock in the morning, so I don't usually get home until about one thirty, two o'clock in the morning. And since what happened a couple of days ago, the nightmares have all come back. All the issues with sleeping have come back. It's basically like it all happened all over again. Yeah, that's definitely not good. When you have these nightmares, what happens in them? It's basically like I'm reliving the moment again. I'll wake up like I had fallen asleep in the tree stand that day. I guess if that's where it starts the dream is it feels like I had fallen asleep in the tree stand and I woke up and looked around and that's when I realized I'm back here again. And I went back before when I was having my nightmares really bad after the first experience. It was the exact same nightmares. The nightmares where I would wake up in the tree stand, still harnessed up to the tree, bow sitting on my hanger right next to me. And it'd be dead quiet. And then I'd have almost the exact same experience happen. Where it would come in, walk underneath my tree, Except for this time, something would either creak or something on my tree stand, and it would look up at me. And it would start moving up the tree, and then I'd wake up back to real life, and I'd be in a cold sweat. I'd be basically hyperventilating. So to say I don't sleep very well much anymore is an understatement. I can understand why. Have you ever looked into what's called lucid dreaming? I haven't. Yeah, that's something that I'm going to have to take up with you after we get done recording here. It's something that I think just might help you quite a bit. If you've had a dogman encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest on one of my two Bigfoot shows, please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let me know. All right, Mike, before I ask you to tell us about this most recent encounter you had, I'm going to play a soundbite from episode 434 where you told us about that first encounter you had. That'll bring everyone up to speed who missed that episode. The first encounter that I had, I was, I think, 18 at the time, and I'm currently 28. I was out on my mom's property and my grandma had a bunch of chickens out there so she told me to help her out by going out and doing little night walks through the whole property trying to protect her chickens from coons because we had really bad coon problem so I was walking around my little 22 revolver and my mom had decided to let the dogs out to go to the bathroom like normal, they went out, they started milling around, doing the normal thing, but then all of a sudden I heard them take off toward the edge of our property that butted up with a cornfield for the neighbors across the road from us. And when this happened, mom started yelling at them, come on guys, get back up in the house. She didn't exactly say it that nice, but she started yelling at them. So I'm like, all right, mom, I'll go up and get them. I went up there to see what they were barking at, and they were barking at the cornfield. I couldn't figure out why. Now, there's a dirt lane that separates the cornfield from my property. The dirt lane leads back to another piece of property back there. But normally, you can look straight down that dirt lane and see probably hundreds of yards down. And this is in the middle of the night. I had my headlight on. So I swiped across the bottom of the corn stalks thinking, you know, maybe it's coyotes. I can see the eyes shine through the corn stalks. Nope, nothing. No deer in the corn stalks. So I looked down the, the, the dirt lane there and I couldn't see nothing. I couldn't see no eye shine. I couldn't see 
nothing standing in the road. I'm like, what are you guys barking at? Go and get back up to the house. But what I didn't realize was, and I realized later, was as soon as I got up there, the dogs had started whimpering and hiding behind me when I had initially walked up. And after I told them to get back up the house, they all took off running. Well, when I got ready to turn to look to go back up to the house, I ended up swiping my headlight across the top of the corn stalks. And right about in the middle of this point of corn that came out, there was a pair of eyes that I could see shining back at me. That the eyes were roughly about maybe six, seven inches over the top of the corn stalks. And of course, the corn at this time of year was almost ready to be harvested. It was fully grown. So this thing, from where I would guesstimate the eyes to be, it'd have to be maybe 10, 11 feet tall, whatever it was. And the eye shine was shining back red. And as far as I know, whenever the eye shine on a deer, it gives it like a green, greenish glow. Coyotes are more of an orange. So whatever this thing is, is not something I have seen before. I couldn't make out any details for some odd reason. It was just a pitch black figure, I guess. Because I couldn't really see any details. All I saw was a pair of eyes staring back at me. So I immediately froze. I'm like, okay, whatever this is, my little revolver is not going to do nothing. It's going to, if anything, it's just going to make it more mad. I'm just going to stand here and see what happens. I'm pretty much frozen in fear at this current moment. Well, it felt like an hour, but it's probably 30 seconds of it just standing there staring at me. And I seen the eyes turn, like what would be the head turn to leave. And then when it turned to leave, I saw the corn stalks part and then come back. And I saw the corn stalks moving, going away from me. At that point, I decided to turn and take off running up to the house. And when I got back up to the house, I was apparently pale as a sheet. My mom says, I look like I seen a ghost. I'm like, I don't know what I seen, but I don't think it was a ghost. Well, fast forward to many years later. Probably about maybe six, seven years later. No, I wouldn't say that long. I'd say probably four or five years later. And I'm out hunting on my mom's property. Same property, but on the back side of it. I left to go out hunting probably about one, two o'clock in the afternoon. It's pretty warm for October. It was, it was probably 60, 60 degrees, 55, 60 degrees. And that year they were talking about it getting colder toward the time of year it was, I was hunting. So it was pretty warm. It was a pretty warm day. I had just gotten up to my stand, got up from the stand, and I sat there for basically the whole day. I didn't see a single deer. I didn't hear a single sound in the woods. There, there are usually some squirrels running around. I have a lot of rabbits in my property. I usually see quite a few of those and well, quite a, quite a few raccoons. And there was nothing. Nothing moved. Which I found odd. But I've had it happen before. So I didn't think nothing of it. I got to about roughly about 6 o'clock because it just started getting dark enough to where I lost. I couldn't look at my pins on my bow sight. And I couldn't see them anymore. Normally you can pick them up because they have those fibers and pick up light and focus it into the end of the fibers for your bow sight. I couldn't see them anymore. But it was still light enough that I could see pretty much everything around me. So I was like, you know what? I haven't seen nothing all day. I haven't heard nothing all day. I'm just going to get out. Go up to the house. Well, normally when I go out hunting, my next door neighbor that was a family member of mine would normally go out hunting down the hill from me. He had a stand set up down there in a small patch of trees down there. I didn't see him come out with me that day, so I didn't think he was out there. 
So I start packing up my stuff. I just get ready to lower my bow down. And I hear something walking up the hill toward me. I'm like, okay, that's not a deer because I know what a deer sounds like when it walks up the hill. It has a four step cadence. This, whatever this thing was that was walking up the hill, was walking on two legs. I could hear it take a step and then take a step. And I'm like, okay, maybe, maybe my next door neighbor did come out with me. So I stopped what I was doing. I was busy paying attention to where the sound was coming from. And I looked where he would normally walk up the hill to me. And I could hear the sound getting closer, but I didn't see any movement. Well, the corner of my eye, probably about maybe 10, 15 feet to the left of where he would normally walk up the hill to me, I caught movement. And it was through thicker stuff. And I'm like, what is that? And I looked at it. And it was a dark black shape coming toward me. I'm like, okay. There ain't nobody else supposed to be out here. And I know for a fact my next door neighbor wouldn't be playing any pranks on me right now. He's not really known for pranks, so I know. So what is that? As it got closer to me and it got out of the thicket into the rock bottom of the tree line that I was sitting in, I got a much better look at it. It was probably, I'd have to say it probably six, it was six to seven feet tall. Maybe larger. So I know its head was halfway between the bottom of my tree stand and the ground. The body itself looked like a person's. It looked like from the waist up it was built like a normal human. I could see the arms. I could see general proportions of the upper torso. But it was covered in black fur. I didn't see a tail, from what I could tell. Its legs looked like dog's legs, from what I could tell. But after I seen its head, I really stopped focusing on anything else aside from its head. And what's sitting on its shoulders was probably the biggest wolf head I've ever seen. The head was massive. It's pitch black. Had a couple of ears sitting right on top of its head. Probably about another good two to three inches taller than the head. The ears weren't as pointed as I've heard some other people talk about it. Because I've listened to your show before. And again, I'm saying, thank God I did. But the ears didn't have the points of fur off of it. They were just straight up pointed just like a German Shepherd. They weren't very tall. I didn't see any teeth. Because it wasn't snarling. And as far as I could tell, I, didn't, I couldn't smell anything either. It was dead quiet once it got into those rocks. And it walked from where I seen it, straight underneath my tree stand, and stopped with its arm against my tree. Now where it's had its arm at was on the opposite side of where my ladder is to get up into my tree stand. So, now I'm cornered. I can't get down. I'm strapped to the tree with a safety harness. At this point, I'm just saying, well, I'm dead. If it looks up, I'm a goner. And at this point, I hadn't made any sounds. I didn't. I was shaking my boots. I had, when I seen it first initially come up the hill, I had sat back down on my stand, so I didn't make any noise. So now I'm practically just staring straight down at it. And I know my bow and arrow is not going to do nothing. At least I don't think it is. If I make one wrong move with that bow and arrow, it's... I only get one shot. The moment I'm sitting here staring at it, it felt like probably half an hour I was sitting there staring at it. Probably maybe 10, 10 seconds. The whole time I'm staring at it, I didn't realize, but a doe that had been bedded probably about 40 to 50 yards away from me to my left side out in that grass field had stood up and looked in our direction. I know she wasn't seeing me because I had plenty enough tree cover behind me and in front of me to where I could see her, but she couldn't see me. And she was looking right directly at my tree. 
She wasn't looking up. She was looking right directly at my tree. So I knew she either seen this thing or smelled it. And I know I I didn't smell anything. I didn't smell anything like wet dog or riding meat like I hear some people say they smell about this thing. I didn't smell nothing. She starts stomping her feet and making this blowing sound. Like they normally do to alert everybody around. And when she starts making those sounds, I turn to look at her. I'm like, okay, that deer's probably 40, 50 yards, like I said. By the time I looked at her and then turned to look back down at my bottom of my stand, this thing was gone. I didn't hear it move. Nothing. By the time I look back up toward the deer, all I see is the weeds parting, and I hear the weeds parting. And then I hear a crunch. Sounds like bone breaking. And I didn't hear any more sounds coming from that door. This all happened probably in the span of two to three seconds. Once I heard the crunch of the dough and I heard some more bones crunching, I said, nope, I'm done. I hurried up and lowered down my bow as quiet and as fast as I could. I got down on the stand as fast and as quiet as I could. And I hightailed it back up to the house. Well, when I got back up to the house, no one was home. And I'm glad they weren't, because if they'd have seen you then, they really would have thought I'd seen something. I know my mom said it looked like I'd seen a ghost before, but I was pale as a sheet. I couldn't get any more white if you asked me to. I went up to my bedroom. I put all my stuff away, took out my shotgun, loaded it with five slugs, racked the shotgun laid it against my bedroom door and I went to bed. The next morning I got up and I decided to head out there to where I seen this thing take down the dough to see if it wasn't just my imagination thinking up. When I went back out I took my shotgun with me. I didn't care. I wasn't out hunting. I wasn't out uh, the only thing I brought that shotgun out with for was self-defense, and I doubt that was going to do much. But at least give me a fighting chance. I got out there to where I had seen the doe get taken down, and there was probably a good 15-foot area. 10 15-foot area that I had seen just in that grass field just laid down. It looked like someone had went through there with, like, one of those big steamrollers in a big circle. And there was blood, there was fur, and I seen a couple of the bones from the back legs laying there. And I know it was from the day before, because when you touched the blood, it was still that... It wasn't dry. It was that kind of slimy wet that it gets just before it dries. It gets congealed before it dries. And I started looking around to see if I couldn't find tracks. Well, in the area that I was looking in, the grass was so pressed down, you couldn't see nothing for tracks at all. So I walked back up toward my tree stand. Couldn't find any tracks along the way. Because, again, the grass was so thick that you couldn't really find tracks. It was once I got past the tree stand, past the little rock line that runs down the tree line, into that spot where I first initially seen it come out that I seen tracks. And up there, it's... The way the dirt is, it's uh, like a clay with a little bit of sand mixed in. So it doesn't exactly pack very easily. It doesn't leave tracks very easily. I know I could probably leave tracks on a day that it's wet. But this was dry. It was dry as can be that day. There was not a cloud in the sky for any rain. There was no rain the night before I came back out. And the only water that was out there was the dew that came from the morning. I walked out there and I seen probably... Two or three tracks 
that were canine prints that were as big as my hand. And I could have set a coffee can over them. You could still see the tips of the paws and the claws. This thing probably had sunk into the ground maybe a quarter of an inch. So whatever this thing was, it was heavy. It was really large. And at that point, I realized that I wasn't imagining what had happened. And I wish I had my old phone because I did take pictures of it. But when I changed phones, I ended up losing them. But it was so surreal. Like It's hard to explain how much fear you get once you realize something actually happened. Like those of us that have been in life and death experiences realize after it's happened that, wow, this actually did happen. You know, I could have died. I didn't, but I could have. It was in that moment that I've seen the tracks and seen what was left of the deer that I was like, yeah, I definitely didn't imagine that. There's no possible way I could have imagined that. And that 10 to 15 foot area just looked like someone took a bucket of blood and stabbed it in the bottom and just started swinging it back and forth. It, is, it literally looked like someone had took that deer and just stabbed it in the artery and just let it drain in that whole area. There wasn't a single spot in the area that wasn't covered in blood. I know because when I walked out of there, my boots were covered in it. I had to go up to the house and spray my boots off before I could even walk in the house. It really looked like I just walked out of a butcher's factory. How much blood was on my boots. I, it was probably the most terrifying thing that ever had happened. All right, Mike, now that everyone's up to speed on your first day encounter, please tell us about this most recent one. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. All right. It was Monday night. I believe it was the 9th. I'm not quite sure what this last Monday was. The way things have been going, the days kind of blurred together. Uh, the night that I got off work, Everybody got off at the same time because the jobs that we were doing were done. We all got off at 12.30, got in the truck and started heading home. Normally when I ride home with these guys, I'm riding in the back seat, but tonight I ended up sitting in the front seat in the passenger side. On our way home, we were talking about some of the stuff that we like to do on the weekends. And probably about 15 minutes into my 30-minute drive home, I ended up getting this weird feeling like I was being... I don't, it was almost like being watched. I, when I was growing up, I got into the habit of when I was riding in the vehicle in the front seat or in the back seat, I would start watching the roads. Because my mom has issues spotting deer whenever we were driving. And I basically fell into my old habit. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to put my phone down. And I'm going to start focusing. And probably about five minutes after I started focusing on the road and talking with the guys, I noticed that we were coming up on a spot that had an open field that goes almost all the way up to the road, but it has a row of trees that go along the edge of the road. Now, the trees themselves are probably about a foot and a half, two feet across. So not very big trees, but they're pretty tall. And right next to this field is a farmhouse that has a big barn that has a one of the big floodlights that goes on the edge of the barn that as we drive past this field the floodlight from the barn generally lights up every single tree on the line as we pass by it and as we were 
going down the road. We were probably going about 50, 55. And I happened to notice up in that tree line, that row of trees, that one of the trees had a pair of eyes that were yellow, amberish color. And my first thought was deer. So I got ready to tell my buddy, hey, you know, there's a deer coming up on the right. But then my mind flashed back to, okay, that's not the right color for the deer. The deer don't have an amberish color to their eyes. They usually flash a green, at least whenever I see them in the headlights. So I focused a little bit more on it. And by now I'm probably about, I don't know, I'd say 15 feet away. I'm still looking at it out the front window. And as we started passing by it, the barn light lit it up, the silhouette. I couldn't see the details of the front. But as soon as I seen the little silhouette, I, I locked up. I couldn't say nothing. I felt like I couldn't breathe. Because what I seen was this tree that was behind was one of the regular standing tall oaks. It's straight up and down. There wasn't no crooks or nothing in it. But I could definitely tell it was a humanoid figure. It was covered in fur. I could see the fur on it. And right where the eyes were, there was a dog's head sitting on his shoulders. And by this time that I noticed what it was, it's basically right outside my door probably about five to ten feet away and i know some people will say it's like a quick glance but uh i don't know if anybody else knows about this but when your body gets into a fear-like state or over hyper your your mind tends to slow things down it almost feels like time has slowed down. Almost like you're watching it through a slow motion camera. That's basically what it felt like for me as soon as I seen this first part of the silhouette. As soon as that light went behind this dog man, as soon as it started lighting up the silhouette, it felt like everything slowed down. I instantly felt all the dread from the first experience come back. I didn't feel like it was as bad. Maybe because I thought I was safe in the vehicle as we were going past it. And I wasn't trapped up in a tree like last time. But it felt like as I was driving past it, it was watching me as I drove by. And I locked eyes with it. I don't know if it locked eyes with me because the windows being the way they are and at night with the headlights on the truck, it's pretty hard to see people on the inside, but I know for a fact it was watching us go by because as we went past it, I seen the head turn with us and the best way I can describe basically what it looked like without describing facial details is I don't know if anybody has seen the picture of someone catching something outside of a fence on a security camp like the, the trail cameras and I only seen it from the waist up because most of the lo lower part of the body was behind the tree but the head of the Silhouette looked exactly like that picture. And the only reason why I say that is because the other night before I contacted you, I was scrolling through Reddit and I ended up seeing that picture. I'm like, wow, that looks a lot like what I see. And the upper body was thinner and a lot less muscular than the first one that I seen. It wasn't as wide across the body. 
and it was shorter. It was probably about six foot. But I don't know. I just got a different feeling from this one. And as soon as I got past it, and it felt like time had flown by, I had basically gone on autopilot and basically gone back into my own mind. Because I didn't even realize it by the time I was home. But as soon as I got home, my fiance was sitting down here waiting for me. And that's when it, like, lights came back on. And she asked me, she's like, are you okay? It looks like you've seen a ghost. According to her, I was pale. I could feel myself shaking. I was having a really hard time breathing. I told her, yeah, I seen it again. She's like, seen what again? I'm like, I, I seen Dogman again. I knew for a fact instantly that it was, there was no way it wasn't anything else. I didn't even think about asking if anybody in the truck had seen it. Because like I said, as soon as I seen that instant brain shut off, I was, I was done. When I had gotten home that night, it took my fiance probably about half an hour to an hour just to get me to calm down enough to the point where I could even eat anything. I was having such issues with my anxiety and stress from everything coming back at once that I told her I, I know I was hungry, but I just I can't eat right now. And the worst part was after when the nightmare started. I'm used to getting anywhere from six to seven hours of sleep, which ain't, I know it ain't much, but it was a lot more than what I was getting before I started talking to you. But now I get probably two, three hours of sleep if I'm lucky. Every single time I go to sleep, it's instant nightmare. It's whether I wake up and start in the tree stand all over again, or I wake up and I'm sitting in the front seat of that truck. And instead of it just standing there, it runs up and runs alongside the vehicle. But before anything else can happen, I'll wake up. And after I wake up, I can't go back to sleep. After that first night of nightmares, I'm like, yep, I got to contact Vic. Got to let him know. After talking with you the first time, it helped me out quite a bit. So I forget the first person to get a hold of would be you to help. Well, like I told you, it goes without saying, I'm so glad you did let me know about what happened recently. Understand, Mike, that the part of your brain that controls your ability to rationalize things switches off whenever you're asleep. That's why you wake up from this dream or that nightmare and you say, what in the world? Why was I running from a banana? Or why didn't I see this? Or why didn't I realize that when I was having this nightmare or this dream? Well, like I said, if your ability to rationalize your way through things is turned off, then you're going to be frightened by things that in your waking hours, you wouldn't be. Like I told you in several of our conversations, the dogmen you've encountered, not once have they tried to harm you. When you're having these nightmares, that switches to, well, basically they're on attack mode. The one under the tree stand, every time it climbs up the tree, then you wake up. Because in your mind, you've got the mindset, okay, his motive is to come get me. He's after me. Even though... When you really have these encounters, not once have they actually tried to come after Mike and get you. So, when you do wake up from one of these nightmares, that's when I want you to remember those seven magic words that I've shared with you and say them out loud to yourself to snap you back to reality, to get you focusing on the fact that, okay, yeah, he did have me dead to rights when he was standing right under my tree stand, and he could have reached up and grabbed me, hauled me out of the stand if he wanted to, he didn't do any of that. He didn't harm you. 
He proved with his own actions he had no intention, no interest in harming you. As long as you focus on that, reality, by remembering the seven magic words, then yeah, you can definitely deal with this, even without mastering lucid dreaming. But what I'm saying here, does that all make sense? Yeah. Good. Because yeah, you can definitely beat this. You definitely can. I don't know for sure. I shouldn't jump to conclusions, but it sounds like after having this most recent encounter, it's more difficult for you to deal with what you've been through, to come to terms with it, than when you had the first two encounters. Is that accurate, or am I off on that? It's not the fact that I can't come to terms with it. It's just I realize that it's happened again. And I don't know if I said it before, but I didn't want to go through it again. I was fine with seeing it from a distance. You know, I know they're there. I don't have a problem with them being around. After I got done talking with you, I got to the point where it's okay, they're out there. Like you said, it didn't want to hurt me. Just stay away from their territory and do your own thing. And they'll do theirs. It's just getting to the point where it's just like it's getting rid of the previous trauma that I'm having a hard time dealing with. Because after seeing it again I ended up instantly going right back to the trauma before. And I don't think I'm having, I don't think I'm, I probably am having issues coming to terms with it, but it just feels like, I don't know, it's just, I kind of stopped talking about it, I kind of stopped thinking about it after I got done talking with you. I got done sharing it with people because all the people that I know around me know about it. At least the ones that I want to know. And, you know, I haven't talked about it in forever since the last time I talked to you, actually. Some people say the more you talk about this stuff, the more it tends to show up. But I just didn't think I would have it happen again. Well, that's normally how it goes. You never think you're going to have another encounter until it happens. You only saw the dog man from the waist up, but did you see enough details to be able to tell if it might have been the same one you saw before underneath your tree stand? I can guarantee you it wasn't. The one that I had seen underneath my tree stand was wider in the shoulders. It was taller. And from what I could see in the silhouette, the one that I had seen under my tree stand didn't have those little tufts of fur on the top of its ears. And this one that I had seen, the ears were slightly more pointed and had tufts coming off the top of the head. And it seemed like the hair around the outside of the head was more, I wouldn't say mangy, but it was more matted and scraggly than the fur that I had seen on the first one. The fur that I had seen on the first one was fine enough to the point where I couldn't see any outward hair sticking out. But this one I could see through the silhouette. I don't know if it was because of the light that gave me the silhouette. But I could see the actual, some of the individual hairs sticking out. And I'm sure if I had had a flashlight and if I had shined it out my window, I'd been, I could have gotten way more details. But again, I didn't think about that at the moment. And the sad thing is I had my phone right in my hand. I could have taken a picture of it, but. And I wish I did. I'm glad you didn't. I think it would have made it a lot worse to 
deal with that experience. Do you see it as being a good thing or a bad thing that it was a different dog man? I don't really know. I almost see it as good because, yay, it's not following me. It hasn't found me again, I guess. But then it just comes back to the point of there's not just one. That there are multiple out there with how many people have seen, I doubt, one dogman could be the cause of all of these sightings. And to this most recent sighting, it made me break it down to the point to where I realized, you know, just because there's one down here doesn't mean there's not more. And I knew that from before because the first one that I see in the corn stalks is way taller than the one that I had in my tree stand. So I already knew that there was more than one, but I figured, you know, these dogmen are part canine. Maybe they live in packs. They stick to a certain area. But after just seeing that one by itself, I'm, I'm not too sure anymore. Well, don't lose sight, too, of the fact that this was really a passive encounter. It was hiding by the tree. It didn't jump out to try and force an encounter to happen. So, you just happened to see it. It didn't force the issue. Please don't lose sight of that fact. Did you get any sense of malevolence from it as you passed by so close to it? No. Matter of fact, if I wouldn't have seen the eyes and if I wouldn't have watched it go physically go by, I would have never known it was there. And I don't think it was trying to hide, really. Because the tree it was standing behind was almost as wide as its shoulders. The shoulders were about maybe two and a half feet across. It could have easily had hidden behind that tree and I would have never seen it. I just happened to look up at the right moment and seen the eyes sticking out behind the tree. I didn't feel nothing. I didn't, aside from the initial thought of dread from going back to tree stand experience, I didn't feel nothing. Well, if you would have felt some malevolence from it, it just would have made that experience that much more difficult to deal with. So I'm so glad you didn't get any sense for that. Is it a source of frustration for you that you didn't call the attention of the guys in the truck with you to that dog man as you were passing by it? It is. Because I know one of my friends that it was in the truck with me believed me wholeheartedly because he's had his own issues with the paranormal and cryptids. I'm not going to get into that. I don't remember the whole story that he told me, but he believes me. One of my friends is kind of on the fence about it, but he said, if you've seen what you've seen, I know you've never lied to me, so I believe you. And the other one is just straight up, I I can't believe it unless I see it myself. And I know for a fact I had enough time to call the attention to it, but I just couldn't. My body locked up. You're only human. So, yeah, you can only do so much. Don't be too hard on yourself. You just brought up the topic of being believed. When we recorded that first show, episode 434, you told us that your fiancé didn't believe you when you told her about that first encounter. Has she come around yet? Yes. And my fiancé is a believer in quite a few many things. She believes pretty much in every cryptid. She believes that certain ones are more spiritual than others. And I believe that's what she thought I'd seen the first time I told her. She didn't believe that I had seen a dog man. She believed that I'd possibly seen something else. And her and I have our little arguments every now and again. But one of the things that I proceed to remain adamant on, I tell her there's no possible way 
that I had seen anything different. That nothing that's not physical could rip apart a deer like I had seen it do. I've had my own experiences with ghosts and the paranormal because my mom's house is very much haunted. And, you know, I've had scratches. I've had things push me. I've had things, you know, hold me off the ground. But I've never seen anything get that kind of violent. Unless it was physical. And the other night when I came home and I was pale as a ghost and I told her I'd seen it again. I think it kind of made her realize that, yeah, I had seen a dog man, not something else. Because she told me, she's like, I believe you. I may not have seen it myself, but I, I believe you. So I'm glad to have her by my side. I'm glad she is by your side now. It sure is a shame that believing in everything the way she did, even back then, that she turned her nose up and didn't believe that you'd actually seen what you told her you saw. Do you think that latest encounter was planned or just happenstance? You told us about how you could still see his eyes around that tree when, if you wanted to totally remain hidden, you could have just hidden behind that big tree trunk and he never would have been seen. I almost felt like it was planned. Because, you know, I felt like, you know, hey, you need to watch a road. You need to watch for deer. And normally I'm not too much worried about it. I just found it kind of odd that that night I was more anxious about running into deer. But then again, on Monday night, it was more foggy than normal. It wasn't quite foggy enough like it was last night, which absolutely terrified me on my way home. But I can almost feel like it was planned. Because like I said, it, it could have very easily just never even shown its presence. We could have drove right past it and never even known it was there. But I happened to be watching the road for the last five minutes. And I happened to look at it. Even my buddy that was driving that was paying attention to the road with me said he didn't even see it. But then again, from what I know of him, he doesn't tend to pay attention too far off to the side of the roads. He'll pay attention directly to the just about just past the white line. Anything past that he doesn't care about. But then again, he grows a big Ford truck, so I don't think he really cares. But I just happened to be looking off that side. And I can't say it'd be coincidence just to see it. Because, like you told me before in when I first talked to you, if they don't want you to see him, you ain't going to see him. I wouldn't be surprised if they were that smart. So for it to just be sticking out from behind a tree, it's a little bit more than a coincidence. Yeah, I'd say you're right on that. It's really unfortunate it had to happen, but it did, so we're just going to do the best we can to deal with it. Well, it's about time for us to get out of here, Mike, but before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Just pay attention. Like Vic said, if you have an encounter with one of these things, just remain calm. If you can. I know it's easier said than done, especially with my experience. It, if you have one, just come talk to Vic. He's been the biggest help for me, aside from my fiance helping me get through at least the stress. Making me realize what happened is not as much on the fear factor side of things than that's what that what my mind's making it out to be. It's so good you realize that. 
And please remember the fact that, yeah, you're not alone in this. You're never going to be alone. Anytime you need help, all you have to do is just let me know. And by all means, we'll schedule another phone conversation to find out what's wrong. So please do remember that. But having said that, I want to thank you so much for coming back on to update us on this most recent experience, Mike. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I appreciate coming on. Well, you know you're welcome. Thanks again so much. Have a great night.